Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. And like magic, presto, I'm back in London and I brought sunshine with me. Can you tell? Can you look outside? There's sunshine. You haven't had sunshine in five months, but now I'm back. There is sunshine. Any coincidence there? I have no idea. Did you fly with Ryanair though? <laughs> <laughs> No, we would never fly with Ryan. Sorry, so a point. <laughs> ah, that's a market train. All right, Marcus, enough of our flying and our sunshine. Who's on the show today? So today we have Michael Sherlock on. Uh, she's a very lovely guest and she wrote, well, two books actually. So one is called Say, Sales Mixology and the other one is called Tell Me More. And we talked, essentially we ended up talking about both, as a matter of fact. And, you know, she was really, really... As soon as she came on camera, I have to say she has a great presence. You know, mm. she is instantly likable and she's incredibly credible. So just you know, you want to talk to her, you want to trust her. And it's a real great gift and a skill to, to have that she's done over the years. Um, before I go into what I got out of the book, tell me, what were your insights from this book? Yeah, so she, as you said, she she has some great. She worked at, with some great companies and in some great companies, and um, she was also kind enough to have me on her podcast as well. So a little disclosure there, but at the same time, it, we had a really great time on her uh, podcast about talking about wicked problems, and now we talked about customers and sales. So what I took away from it is um, two things. One is that uh, the way she wrote sales mixology is sort of like she tells a story with fictional characters. Even so, the fictional characters are actually all based in reality. So all the bits and pieces she found here and there, she put together in this kind of storybook, which is really nice because it's telling a story and I think it's very relatable. So it's not trying to be over-analytical. It does it through fiction that's based on reality. And I found that quite nice. It's quite different and most people are writing about it. And I think it will help people to a little bit better understand scenarios, which then reminded me a little bit of... Um, a recent guest we had as well when we talked about service storming about basically acting out what is going on, what's out there, and through that understanding way, way better what's there rather than having some graphs and some processes that are mapped out. So I really like that. And when I asked her at the end, you know, how do you ask the right questions? Uh, she responded like, well, you know, ask why and why this and why that and don't assume things. Treat things as assumptions. Um, and that's really lovely because I think the whole story and exploring the why of what's actually out there, I find it more important than ever because the map has changed. The world is very, very different today than it was definitely over, over a year ago. And so I think that is one of the more important things to, to focus and take away from and explore more for any organization out there now regardless of industry, literally, really regardless of industry at this point. So that, that was my ma major takeaway in that one. What's yours? Yeah. Even though the book was entitled Sales Mixology, there was mm. so much in it about teams and, and management. And this is not your classic sales book that tells you no. how to talk to a customer and how to go and get them to, to say yes and, and all the rest. So I think that she's bringing in so much of her additional kind of leadership and management skills that that really adds incremental value. I think the, the other thing is she was saying, I've kind of gotten out of consulting. Uh, it just It's just too much work. And oftentimes <laughs> the people don't want to be under the microscope. They don't want to yeah. be actually under the microscope and have to ask the hard questions. And the, the last point was she was in agreement with me that sometimes people don't have problems. What they've got are symptoms. And they're really, the art is figuring out what's the underlying problem, which is what you and I talk about all the time. Love the problem, oh, yeah. not the solution. The solution, yeah. But anyway, Marcus, you know, the sunshine is out. And guess what? Somebody just brought me a gin and tonic. And that means we should do what? Go to the interview. Before the interview, a quick word from our very first sponsor, Sandcaster. We use Sandcaster for all our audio and video recording, and it's a very nifty tool that splits up all the channels for very easy editing. Sandcaster is used by 10% of all active podcasts. You can get 40% off the first three months and unlimited audio and video recordings with our special coupon code, Wicked Podcast. I repeat, I repeat, I repeat, 
Wicked Podcast for 40% off. And now, the interview. Hello everyone, and welcome to the show. Today we have Michael Sherlock with us. Hello Michael, and thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. So as usually, we start from the top, and that means please tell us a little bit about who you are and why you wrote the book, or books, there's many, but please start with the one we talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. My name is Michael Sherlock, and I own and operate two businesses. One is called Shock Your Potential, and that is my primary business where I um, teach leadership, sales, and professional development seminars all over the world. And that was really the purpose of writing both of my books thus far and more to come. And I also own a company called Kukwa Biz, which is a remote staffing company where we match talented professionals from Kenya with small businesses all around the world. So um, I guess the the reason I wrote both my books and <clears throat> the um, first book that I wrote was called Tell Me More, How to Ask the Right Questions and Get the Most Out of Your Employees. And I really wrote that to of document the leadership journey that I took throughout my career, which the pinnacle, the, the end of that in the corporate world was leading teams of as many as 500 people at a time and being responsible for upwards of almost a hundred million in revenue a year. And I really wanted to be able to document, you know, the mistakes I made, the challenges I had, and finally what got me through to the end result, which was learning how to ask more questions and better questions, which is actually kind of the premise of sales mixology, which was, you know, how do I take this further? And in sales and customer experience environments, how do we know what questions to ask to get to not only an excellent experience for the customer, but to really increase revenue opportunity? So it's been quite a journey. I have a few more books that are in the works uh, that will be coming, but uh, I've really enjoyed the process. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, on the book, it says something to have this particular recipe for that, which obviously goes really well with the mixology and with the drink I share right mm -hmm. now, actually. I'm having my cocktail here. Uh, for, <laughs> you know. Um, I know I'm jealous. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, freedom of, um, well, we have a video now, so I can't be careful with this, huh? right? And essentially, um, <laughs> but the, the, the really nice thing there, and that relates me a lot to the, to the work we do as well, is, you know, you go into businesses, and you tell them, like, you know, what should we do? And a lot of businesses basically say, look, we're quite different. We're like this. We're not like that. And then when someone comes along with a recipe, which is what consultants often do, and then businesses say, yeah, but that's not going to work here. Mm -hmm. Or you can't just have a recipe. Or sometimes they want a cookie cutter, but it's very, very different. So when organizations come back to you saying, like, oh, yeah, it's, we don't do recipes or we're a bit different, what do you usually tell them? How, how, does, it, how does it gel into it? Well, and I love that. It's such a great question because I always start with, well, tell me more. What makes you different? Because I want to have the dialogue. I don't want to say, hey, I don't care how different you are. This is one recipe. Um, but it allows me to really get a business owner, a, an employee, a leader to talk about why they think that they are systematically or organizationally different than others, either in their industry or in their area. And those are great conversations because what we come out of it, and I don't have to point this out to them, but what comes out of it is that most of the time we're all very much the same. We just are very afraid that we're going to be seen as something cookie cutter. So one of the questions I ask is, you know, what's your favorite family recipe either that you make or someone in your family has made? And so they'll come up with all kinds of, you know, amazing things. And I ask, do you, if you make the recipe, do you follow that recipe exactly or have you put your own spin on it? Because the, a core recipe is fundamental. There's certain elements of a recipe that need to be followed to have an end product that's good. But that doesn't mean that you can't allow for individuality. You can look at things from your unique customer's perspective or your unique country's perspective but understand that there's a reason for the recipe and that's to give you a baseline that's going to turn out with a product that is, is going to be good. But throughout, you know, just those questions that I ask people help them to realize in the end of the day that they, that we're all just still humans dealing with humans and the differences are less important as our willingness to try something that takes us out of our comfort zone and find different success being different from what we've been doing. Yeah. And when you, when you say that, so 
Yeah, the cookie cutter is such a typical thing, and I think it's sort of mm -hmm. the way. I've, I sometimes find it a bit of a paradox when you have companies who say, "Well, we're different. We're doing things differently, and certain things don't work." And at the same time, they have a thrive to really make things cookie cutter because it saves money, and especially with bigger organizations, there's this thrive mm -hmm. that then goes counter, recognizing that actually you have 50 teams and they're all a little bit different. And when you start talking about that, mm -hmm. then some people are going like, oh, let's do the Spotify model because the Spotify model is sort of, you have to process, but everyone treats it differently. And as of some reason, articles, even Spotify doesn't mm -hmm. actually do the Spotify model for some reason. Um, how do you then, how do you then mm -hmm. sort of balance between that paradox to say, some side of the company probably is going to say, well, you're just going to pay that system and then everyone's going to use the system and hopefully in the same way. And then we're going to have a process and it's going to be signed off. And there you go. How do you, how do you break those? Can you break those, those, those elements of sign off of process and procedures and, 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 and all these, all these big, more important people sitting there and signing things off? Uh, can you, or how do you deal then with those existing structures in order to make things more personalized? Don't worry, Michael. He'll eventually finish the question. I just did, didn't I? I just did. I got it. I was following him along. <laughs> See, our guests pay well, attention. And, and that's the thing. <laughs> Meanwhile, Troy's going, come on, come on. Um, which is actually a great example because some of us, you know, move faster at the end of the question. Some of us are like, whatever, I'm on board. Um, what I love about what I did with my recipe in this book is didn't say, here's the five steps. I said, here's the five important ingredients. You know, and so I put it into what I call the blend, the recipe, the blend. So, you know, the B stands for be immediately and fully present. So it's not a, you know, here's the 10 steps to be a better sales organization. It's, are we really aware and are we paying attention to our customers? And so when we start to ask these questions about, why are you different? What I'm really trying to find out is tell me why you think you're different because I want to know. We can still use that in, in the environment, but at the end of the day, my question is, do your salespeople, in this, in this ex example with sales mixology, do your salespeople really show up fully and presently engaged with their customers? So, you know, let me ask you guys a question. Have you ever walked into a store, uh, maybe a clothing store, uh, you know, a, going to buy a cell phone, something, and everyone who works there is on their phone and the, and somebody glances up because they heard the bell ring over the door and they go, hi, welcome to, you know, ABC, you know, technologies. Uh, let us know if we can help you with anything. And, and you're like, could you even look at me? Could you actually seem like you care that I called? or that I walked in the door. In fact, this morning I called to schedule finally some appointments, doctor's appointments, you know, annual things that you haven't done forever. And when I called uh, the the hospital to, um, to get one of these appointments, the person who answered the phone goes, hello, you know, Je <laughs> Jeff's in the hospital. I'm like, good God, did I bother you? Have you not had your coffee? And so what you tell me, what your salespeople tell me as the customer, is that if they're not immediately and fully present, they don't care whether or not I spend money. So you as the salesman or you, you as the CEO, if you don't know whether or not your people care, then you can't even get any farther. So you can tell me all that you want that you're different, but if your sales results are not where they are, I can guarantee you by the time you get down and you break those things apart, that you don't have your sales team operating with the highest, um, not, not just about the customer is always right, because the customer is not always right but with the company's best interest in mind and with an actual care and concern that a customer wants to do business with you, AKA spend money with you. And so my elements of the B, L, E, N, D and blend, you know, so be immediately and fully present, listen with your ears and your eyes, ensure you've asked all the right questions that are important and is never, ever, ever let them feel like a number. But the D is what I always wrap it up with, which is, Deliver an exceptional customer experience while always being mindful of a financial return for your company. In other words, respect the people who pay your paycheck. Respect the business that writes your check. And when we do those things and we dive down in them, then, then businesses start to say, oh, okay, let's start over. Okay, let me tell you why we're different help us figure out where we're off the mark. And that's when we start to have dialogues that really make a difference. And those are the right kind of questions to be asking. Sorry, Marcus. 
Um, I just wanted to say, I wanted to say, like the one person that definitely always says hello is the security guard at the entrance. I think that's always happening. They got that yes. one right, don't they? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Troy. Isn't no, that wonderful? Um, <laughs> I think that there are a couple of things. There's the whole um, unengaged employees, which mm -hmm. can be a serious problem. And they're either unengaged because they're unmotivated, they have no idea what the vision is, they're underpaid, you know, whatever. And so the, the problem may not be that the people don't know how to treat customers. Maybe they're not motivated to treat customers, which is a much different problem. But moving right. on to one of the questions is getting the balance between customer experience and business value is really important. Um, there mm -hmm. is an, an airline in the European area, who is my <laughs> least favorite airline in the world, who provides a <laughs> negative customer experience at every step of the entire journey and just looks for profit. That's all they care about. They are the most profitable and the most used airline. And I had somebody actually explain it to me that their view is uh -oh. we're he giving you <laughs> customer experience at the end of your journey. So you're, we're getting you somewhere. And if it kind of falls apart along the way, so Ryanair, you know, is just one of those companies that doesn't have any balance at all. They've got a zero or a negative customer experience and 100% focused on just make profit. Other mm -hmm. companies focus 100% on the customer value and not focus enough on the profit and wind up going bust because mm -hmm. you've still got to be beholden yeah. to your shareholders. Um, how, do you, how do you tell leaders and communicate within an organization this balance? Mm-hmm. Well, it really comes, you made a great point about how many people are not engaged. I was just, I just watched a, some, a read some bullet point that said before the pandemic, 72% um, of American workers said that they were unengaged at least like 30% of their work week. I mean, that's just terrifying. Uh, just to think about that. Now, I don't think anybody's even answering that question right now because nobody wants to have the microscope on them. But um, but there is a way to find the balance. And, you know, my book has kind of, you know, and I tell it in a story format for a reason, and that's to make you, you know, um, fiction allows you that ability to have suspension of, of disbelief. Say, okay, this might seem really perfect in a perfect world where a business operates at an incredible capacity. But I write it in that format for that specific reason to show you what can be if a business really cares enough to train people, make sure they're hiring the right people first and train them to a level that they not only know their job, but they feel safe asking questions, that they, that they challenge their own training methods, that they're looking for more. But at the end of the day, they understand that their position is vital in the greater scheme of that business. And that's where people miss the mark is when they don't think that their job matters. Well, a lot of times they don't think their job matters because there's a system within the company that proves out. You can have the plaque on the wall that says our employees are our number one um, you know, resource, but it's a bunch of bunk. And on the flip side, you can have companies that say, okay, we're going to train you really well. We're going to hire you exceptionally you know, through a, a rigorous process, but we're going to expect a lot of you. And we're going to expect that you consider that this is your business. And that you would treat it as if it is your money on the line, not just a job to be in. And so I, I love to put the challenge out there that we don't push this enough. We don't push this idea enough of a sense of ownership and belonging for the employee in the organization. And that takes a lot of effort. But when you do it, people aren't so willing to waste a moment, waste a, a customer experience, waste a dollar, you know, steal a box of paper clips. They're less willing to do those things when they value the company's writing of their paycheck because they see that they're in uh you know entwined and that it's important that they that they that they deliver a return on investment for that company and it takes more work and it takes more effort which is like why a lot of businesses don't do it it just takes more time but once you do it the payoff is so great that you say, okay, that took a lot of time and effort, but now we see why. Now we have loyal employees, they stay longer, we have a higher customer experience, um, and now we have higher uh, returns on our, on our investment of our people and, and the services that we offer. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's really, really important to get right and to get employees engaged. But the other half of that is knowing when they're not engaged mm -hmm. and as leaders caring that they're not engaged 
and as leaders in a business feeling empowered to fix the underlying problem. I think that we find a number of occasions where it may be one small team or one group or one division that decides to do things differently and it starts infecting the rest of the organization with positive transformation. Yeah. Over to you, Marcus. Absolutely. And people are afraid. Yeah, they they can be afraid of, of, of demanding that kind of environment. But employees, when they are motivated enough to say we want that kind of environment, if if the company's got the right people at some level, they will listen and they will deliver. Yeah, and I think it's quite telling when you're in the middle of projects, transformation projects, where you know things have not been going quite right. And then you see sort of the level of engagement that normally tells you how bad things are when you ask open questions and you don't get a lot of response mm-hmm. to it. And one of that aspect then also goes into the whole sort of a mantra of, you know, love the problem, uh, not the solution, is that can you actually challenge the problem perceived by the leadership? You know, there's direction and people say, this is the problem we want to fix, this is what we want to improve, this is what we want to do. Are they actually listening to the people who work for them? And one of the, one of the things, therefore, is can you actually challenge that? So in that sense, you know, um, in that sense, how do you get organizations to embrace this kind of more holistic view on things to say, look, we as leaders are not giving you the solution mm-hmm. and tell you exactly what to do, but we're actually honest enough to say we're not, we're biased ourselves. We don't know the map ourselves fully. So why don't you help us together that we actually get there and we're listening to you and then we take action on that. How, how, do, you, how do you go about that to establish that with organizations? Well, it's interesting because because when I get brought in, um, most of the time, and I don't do a lot of consulting work anymore uh, because it's just exhausting. <laughs> I'd rather come in, help train and move on. But I still, ha- from time to time, get uh, get pulled into you know these scenarios, which I love. And I had, I think the greatest example I have is I was working with a, a medical practice of, I think it was eight physicians. And of course, they brought me in to say, help us fix our problem. We're not profitable in these areas of our business. They have to do with sales. How can we do this? And I said, okay, um, I will consider taking you guys on as a client, but I want you to understand what this is going to be is the focus is not what your team is doing wrong. The first focus is what are you doing wrong? (laughs) And, uh, you know, eight physicians sitting around a table who are all surgeons, you know, they've, they're way more educated than I am, you know, highly driven people. And they're looking at me like I had two heads. And I said, no, honestly, the thing is, is it all starts at the top and it's you guys and your office manager. So when I start to investigate, I am not first looking at the bottom of of the food chain. I am going to talk to you guys. And they all agreed because it was really funny. They, they thought they were, you know, they're like, oh, well, we don't know if we're going to hire you. I said, you don't understand. I don't know if I'm going to be hired by you. I don't, I haven't chosen you guys yet because you have to be able to go under the microscope. And um, it was an interesting. I ended up finding um, where they had lost almost a half a million dollars from a series of mistakes by one person. But the, her mistake was because it was continued to be allowed and overseen and ignored and therefore given permission. And you might think, how can one person create a half a million dollar problem? Well, it was very easy. And that was just what I found when I reviewed uh, two and a half years worth of data. So chances are they had lost millions. But when I came back to him and I said, here's the problem, here's the gap. And it happens with you guys. And I said, now, just so you know, the other day I was walking through the halls and I heard, and I turned to the one physician and I said, I heard you say X, Y, Z to a patient, which basically said, don't come to our, you know, don't, don't buy that product through us. Go to Costco. It's cheaper. And I said, you, we're giving mixed messages. In order to fix this and fix the problem, you guys have to be aligned. You have to be one team. You have to work with one voice. And if you're not, then you're never going to fix all the problems. Maybe that's okay with you, but you'll have to decide how much financially you are willing to lose as opposed to coming together and having one clear vision. And I'll tell you what, that was, it was a really big pill for them to swallow, Um, but they did it. And they started to turn around and the, the way they operated was much differently. And it was so much healthier that even to this day, some of those employees still connect with me and say, I can't believe that, this, you know, that we're still having this kind of opportunity. That was 15 years ago, you know? And so 
things can have lasting long-term effect, but it's somebody has to have, and that's a lot of the reason that, you know, people like us are brought in is somebody from the outside has to be the one often to make the uncomfortable dialogue about here's the problem. Employees can find ways to do it, but it is challenging and it doesn't always have great outcomes for them. There are ways to do it though. It just takes a lot of guts and it takes a lot of planning in order to have those dialogues that nobody wants to have. And I, I think if you go a bit back to your other book, oh, Tell Me More, I was started off in IT and I did tech support. And I got a phone call one time many, many years ago that still sticks with me. I've got a problem. I can't print. And at the end of the mm -hmm. phone call, I had realized the printer wasn't plugged in. And what they had described <laughs> to me was a symptom. And the symptom was I can't print. The problem was the printer mm -hmm. isn't plugged in or it's out of ink or it's out of paper. So when somebody yes. comes to us and says, the problem is we're not making as much profit. I'm like, no, actually, that's the symptom. Now let's dig in and exactly. figure out what is the one or more problems that result in you not having the profitability that you'd like to be able to have. And so we, we always have to love the problem, not the solution. And let's get to figure out what is the problem. And sometimes it's politically charged. You know, you're going to oh, tear yes. down somebody's fiefdom, you know, some little empire building actions that are going on and they don't want to be called out on it. But if you have the Absolutely. right environment where there are no sacred cows and you can ask any question you want, it, it's healthy, even if painful. Yeah. And I love that line. Love the problem, not the solution. I think that's a perfect way to, to characterize it because until you love the problem enough that you're willing to uncover it and look at it in the light of day and hold it up and have it be seen, then all those symptoms you know, are just going to be more painful because they're going to fester longer and longer. And so, you know, as we, as we get there, it's going to take some, some uncovering of that. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. And uh, following it with another potentially snappy line. Uh, so, you know, experiment like there is a tomorrow. Um, some of the yeah. best performing companies like to tell everyone that they're doing like a thousand experiments a month and they're trying a lot, a lot of small things. Which then indicates, well, that means, you know, and they tend to say that, and it's quite evident that, you know, there's going to be a lot of failure there. There's a lot of small de-risk mm -hmm. failure, but there is. How do you go about to implement something like that where you say, look, you don't just do one or two things. You do 10. You try. And you expect mm -hmm. that 9 out of 10 will fail, but the 1 gets you 1 iteration further. Um, how do you get people into that experiment yeah. ten, experimentation or sometimes people like to call it sort of the long game that is just not the right or wrong, but actually the better mm -hmm. and better and better? How do you how do you get people there? Well, one thing is, you know, as a leader, you have to share your own failures and, and you have to. I mean, it's I, I always joke that I, you know, make 10 mistakes before breakfast and uh, 17 before I've had my second cup of coffee, you know? Um, so, but you have to give those examples. Like, here's how I screwed up. Um, and I've been really working on this with my team now for uh, the last six months. So I'll give you a, for instance, I, you know, I constantly say, look, there's, you were all going to make mistakes and, and, you know, most of them are not going to be life or death. So we can come back from all of them. And I encourage them to share those with each other, share those with me. And I, we had one that really played out, interestingly enough, we had something go on last week. The details really don't matter, but I had one of my team that made a mistake that had to do, uh, basically got us flagged in our, um, in our CRM for a message that went out to the wrong group. So that can flag you with GDRP and, you know, all these anti-spam things. And it's, you know, that can be a costly mistake. And it wasn't this time. We'd never made a mistake. We have a very clean record. Um, but the he made the mistake, but I made the mistake because I didn't train him for that. And he took a risk on something that we needed and found a solution that ended up having another problem, you know. But it was great because when I went to him, I, I asked him the question. I'm like, hey, tell me what happened here. And just so you know, it's not the end of the world, but this could be costly to us in the future. So let me tell you how we're going to avoid it. But I didn't tell you this. I didn't train you to this point. I didn't tell you what the repercussions were of that. And so, you know, in the end, I knew he was nervous. He was upset that he had done something that, you know, had caused a problem, but it wasn't life or death. And the way he handled it was 
fantastic. But I love the fact that he came back and said, just so you know, um, I, I researched this even more. Not only will it not happen again, but I'm really glad that I am now have some more questions to ask. And that's, you know, that's what you want to celebrate. You want to celebrate those, you know, mini failures, but you have to be able to show them yourself and you have to prove it out because otherwise people won't believe it. If you don't share your own mistakes that you've made, you don't have to share every one, but share examples or share something that you've done that um, proves that you make mistakes as well. And you can keep getting back up from them. And people will start to understand that that is the culture that you're trying to create but it can't be just words. It has to be followed up with, with reality. It has to be authentic. Mm. And, you know, authenticity is, is, it's become such a popular used word. We're going to have to find a new word for being authentic because it's being abused, I think, in some mm -hmm. ways. So it's a, it's a really important thing to get. Um, we are in the luxury position and the terrible position at the same time of always having more questions than we have time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to ask you a really quick question. I'm going to give Marcus the ability for the, the wrap up question. As we say, the book is written as a beautiful story. How much of it's true? <laughs> I get those questions all the time. Um, so there's elements in each part of the story that are true, but not necessarily all together. So for instance, the experience, you know, that my main character has in the beginning in the cocktail lounge, that cocktail lounge and the beauty of the cocktails was based on an actual uh, hotel experience in Belfast, North Ireland. Um, but how that those people were trained and how they operated with the, the customers was not true. But each one of those parts was true in another element of another client that I've worked with or another colleague or my own experiences. And so as you weave them through, I like to take those pieces, kind of like take the best parts of everything and put it together mm -hmm. and show what because there's no reason that that hotel couldn't have had that entire experience. They just didn't. But businesses, when they when we look at it and say, okay, we may not be that perfect, but what is one takeaway that we could take from this, of this perfect example, and how could we employ it in our business to raise that customer experience even a minute level? Because those, those minor increases are what make up continual desire to continue to improve. So as we pull it together, every part of their, that story has some truth. But I will tell you one thing, that the funny thing was, is that in the very end of the book, when uh, my character, uh, Jane, is on the airplane going back home, and she's hearing the guy with about the Bloody Mary, the, the flight attendant did not bring him all those things. I gave him those things out of my bag because I knew <laughs> that a spicy Bloody Mary was the only way to go, and they don't serve those on planes. So <laughs> that one is true. It's just me. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> All right, Marcus, have you got one last one? I think I have one. Yeah, I was just looking through our questions, trying to pick the right one for a nice wrap up. But um, you talk a lot about questions and asking the right questions. Do you have some uh, insightful advice on the kind of questions, characteristics you, you tell people like this is sort of a good question and this is not what, what sort of makes makes the right questions for you? Well, I think it all starts with what we make as assumptions. So if I'm selling cars and someone walks in to buy a car, I assume they are there to buy a car. Now, if I see them buy the sports car, I might assume they want to buy a sports car. Now, the thing is you don't want to be obnoxious in your questions, but you're still just making assumptions. Now, they are probably there to buy a car at some point in time. So it's not just like, hey, can I sell you a, car, a sports car today? It's, hi, I'm so glad to see you. What brings you in to look at cars today? That allows us somebody to say, well, I'm looking because I need to... Um, I, I'm not going to have my company vehicle in another few months. So I'm starting to shop or I'm looking for, you know, it's time for me to retire. I'm going to buy the sports car. But by asking certain questions about, you know, what brings you in today or what makes you call to look at our services today, you learn the immediacy. You learn what is driving somebody that day. And then just think about the questions that are related to your product, goods, or service that allows the person to tell you exactly why they're there. You probably are right on a lot of assumptions, but not all of them. But reg regardless of whether or not you're right or wrong, until the customer says, this is what I want at the time I want it, we don't know for sure and we can blow a sale or an experience very quickly. But once they say that out loud, they are committed. 
they will are now a part of the process. So even if somebody said to me, I am looking because I want to find the perfect car because in three months I'm going to lose my, my company vehicle and I want to have the new car ch chosen by them. And my next questions are going to be easy. Well, what kind of car are you most excited about? How soon before you lose your company car do you want it? You know, what's important to you? Until the person says, you know what, I want this sports car and I want to be able to have it at least a month before I lose my company car. Boom. All right. Now we've got a timeline. We've got an exact uh, description. And now we have um, a place to actually start the negotiation. And that's the element is the questions are always about put yourself in that person's shoes. What questions would you want asked of you that would make you feel respected, wanted, and not be sold? And that's the part of the element that no matter what you sell, because we all sell something, then that will always give us that perspective of the person, that customer, and help us to create a journey for them that makes it faster, easier, and way more enjoyable for everyone involved. Wonderful. I think, you know... That little word why is something that a lot of people should more adopt for sure, right? Especially in times like these mm -hmm. where we are drawing a brand new map of the world and a uh, few yes. people really ask why. Yeah. Great word to end on. So, uh, Michael, thank you very much for your insights and for being with us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co host Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also, learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com.